Feel the, the joy of the Lord in the room today for many. But I wanted to take a moment and pray if there's anyone in the room that might be experiencing heaviness. If there's anybody that you're, you're carrying something into this place today that's been weighing on you, that's been a burden, that's taken up your mental space, that's been troubling you, would you be bold enough to stand up? I'm gonna stand with you. It's, it's been a bit of a heavy week. And I see you standing and you are not alone. And more importantly, the Lord sees you standing and he understands the weight that you're carrying. And I wanna remind someone today, we're gonna remember today. It's what we were doing with communion. It's what Daniela just so beautifully guided us through that we, we remember the cross. We remember Jesus with his disciples. We remember him taking on our sin. We remember him being resurrected. And that's salvation for you and me. And I want to remind those of you in the room, and in particular those who are carrying something heavy, that there is going to come a day in this lifetime when the Lord calls you home. The room in the Father's house has already been prepared for you. Your bed is ready, and he's going to take you home. And you are going to transfer from the natural into the supernatural. And you are going to go to some place that you and I can't comprehend. But I can tell you this. There are angels that are walking with you right now, guardian angels that have been assigned to your life since birth, that have been walking with you and protecting you and guiding you. And they are going to take you up to this heavenly realm. And you are going to be at a gate. And it is not going to be a Disney World line. It is going to be you and the gates of heaven. And you are going to be welcomed by somebody who's close to you. It could be a family member, it could be a mentor. That person is gonna welcome you into the kingdom of heaven. You're not gonna see Jesus right away because it would be too much for you to handle. So that person's gonna welcome you in. You're gonna walk through the gate and at one point you're gonna be face to face with your creator. Jesus is gonna be standing in front of you and he's gonna call you by your name, welcoming you home. Welcome home, Megan. Welcome home, Zaina. Welcome home, Mila. Welcome home, Donald. Welcome home, Cameron. It's just going to be you and him. And that moment, I can only imagine. And then your real life will begin, and the heaviness that you are carrying today will not even be in your memory. It won't be a thought. We are made for the kingdom, and like Peter says, we're here to suffer for a little while. So I want to pray for you that we would, we would have an eternal mindset in our short-term troubles. And there's a, there's a scripture that is dear to me, and it helps me, and it, it comforts me, and I hope it does the same for you. 
is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians, it's chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And Paul says, it is because of God that you and I are firmly rooted in Christ Jesus. It is because the love of the Father, the Father, your God, your God is a good God. Your God is a loving God. Your God is a powerful God. Your God is your creator and he loves you and he knows your name and it's because he loves you that he sent his son. It's because of God, Paul writes, that you and I are standing firm in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say that he anoints us. It means he empowers us. And then he, then he says we get sealed with ownership. We belong to him. We belong to a righteous kingdom and a holy God. And then he says, and I want you to catch this today, and I want you to hold on to it. He deposits his spirit into your heart as a promise for what's guaranteed. We here in this room know what a deposit is, correct? We put down a deposit to ensure that we're going to get something. We put down a, a deposit that holds our space so we can move into the apartment. The Holy Spirit is your deposit for the guarantee of the kingdom that's to come. I hope that encourages someone in this room. I, I hope that it encourages you who are standing. So I'm going to pray for you, Lord. I pray over the people of this house. I pray over one name. I pray over this family, and in particular, those who are standing, those who have, are carrying heaviness, those who have burdens that are heavy. Lord, I pray that you would take them. I pray that you would exchange yokes with these sons and these daughters. I pray that you would move mightily here in this space, that they would walk out refreshed. They would walk out renewed. They would walk out with an eternal understanding of how they were created, who they were created to be, and that they would get a real glimmer of the smallness of their problems. And I pray, Lord, that they would feel the anointing that they would tangibly feel the anointing that you are putting upon them. They would feel the anointing and that they would feel the seal of ownership, that they would know exactly who they belong to, the kingdom of heaven. So all darkness must flee, all disease must flee, all trauma must go. The anointing, the seal of ownership, and I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak in such a clear way over these individuals, not just today, but in the days to come. Holy Spirit, come alive in our hearts. Just seal that deposit, Lord. Just speak to us, comfort us, edify us, Lord. I pray right now, I impart peace over these people, Lord. I pray that if you are carrying something heavy, that you will feel a real shift and a real change in the atmosphere of heaven in your life, in your home, in your finances, with your children, in your career. May you have eyes to see, ears to hear, walk in freedom. It is for freedom that you were set free. Know who you are in Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And today is the day that the Holy Spirit is going to minister to you in a new measure. And you're going to walk in a new understanding of who you were called to be. May your problems get less and may your God get bigger. I declare that over your homes, over your hearts, over your households. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, guys. Good morning. How's everyone feeling? It's good to be here. Uh, some of us were talking in the, the pre-service huddle. Just, it's kind of mushy in here today. I know I'm, I'm feeling a little mushballish. Just kind of feeling really grateful for everybody. Just looking in people's eyes. Just taking some time to 
really be grateful for this house. Um, this is a house of prayer. This is a house of worship. This is an open house. There's still some empty seats. Invite your friends, invite your family. This is an open house. It's also a house of miracles. If you've been with us for a week, you might have experienced a miracle here. If you've been with us since the beginning, you understand that this whole thing is just a miracle. It's a miracle that he even called a couple knuckleheads like Pastor Jesus and I into this role. That's what he does. He, he calls the unqualified, then he qualifies them, he sends them. Um, the miracles, family miracles, relationship miracles, financial miracles, healing miracles, just the fact that we're together. Um, I want to take a moment, you can see the QR code, uh, and I want to thank everybody who has sown seed and who has been a part in building God's church here. I, I want to thank the heavy lifters. There are some of you here with the gift of generosity and who have done well for yourself. The Lord has blessed you. And I want you to know that you're seen and we thank you and, and the Lord sees it. Those of you who are able to push the envelope and, and really make an impact because of your means. And I want to thank the recurring tithers, those people that regardless of circumstance, regardless of situation, regardless of how they feel, they're just going to deposit, deposit, deposit into what God is doing. It, it, it helps. It helps us plan. It helps us understand. It helps us budget. It helps us pray. It helps us allocate. And, and then I want to thank those of you who, who you, you think you may give a little. And I'm telling you this, and I believe it's the heart of God. We care more about the names on the list than the dollar amounts. The dollar amounts, sure, they, they're impactful. But I would rather see just a long list of names. So if you're one of those people that you give $5, $10, and you think that's small, I want to remind you that it's not. The Lord sees it, and the Lord can breathe on it, and the Lord can bless it. And especially if it's done with the heart posture of love where you say, this is my seed. The Lord can do many, many miracles with it. And so thank you. And if we want to see more miracles, if we want to see the Lord move in greater measure, it requires continuous generosity. So we continue to give because we continue to serve, because we continue to be expectant for what the Lord's doing in this house and beyond. And we experienced miracles in this house um, in January on two separate trips. The, the warrior women trip and the sons and brothers, many of you have been on those trips and heard all about them. Our team, uh, Julian, I think is back there, put together a really beautiful video. And I wanna, I wanna show it because it's gonna move your heart and it shows you what God does, but it's, it, it kinda shows you the partnership of the miracle. It, it took finances to go on these trips. The Lord uses people and he uses resources. And so those of you who gave, and, and, and gave with a cheerful heart out of the overflow, realizing that your, your barn will overflow. Those of you who gave, you, you gave to the platform that the Lord was going to use to do the miracle. All the miracles are going to be on the screens, but you helped facilitate that by putting in your seeds. So it's a big deal, and it's a partnership, and we're honored and grateful to do it with you guys. After the video, the uh, buckets will go through, and, and you can give in the envelopes. You can give online. We thank you. Um, I'll pray over the offering after the video, but please enjoy and please be blessed by it. I believe that there's a tremendous need of, of, of men finding their identity. Uh, they need to be free from themselves first. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to stand in, in the battlegrounds and I'm going to the battle to stand in the gap, not only for myself and my family, but for all of you guys. I believe that the Lord has so much more in store, but we got to get free from ourselves first. We've got to die to ourselves in order for us to step into our true identity in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Jesus. We just go after him. 
we actually get the Bible and actually apply it to our lives. We actually align our lives with the Bible. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing in this hour, in this house. Thank you for building a house of miracles, a place where we are being baptized under the water, becoming new creations. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst, in our families, in our homes, amongst us here at the church. Thank you for shining the light of the gospel here and beyond in Miami. We thank you for all of the saints who have been giving to this mission. We thank you and ask that you would continue to stir them up, continue to bless them, continue to show them the vision that you have for this house, the zeal for this house that would just raise up and rise up. Lord, we, we thank you for what you're doing. We're expectant, and we believe that whatever offering it is that we bring forth to you, that you will breathe on it, you will bless it, you will touch it with your holy grace, and that you will do your will, as we sang about before, on earth as it is in heaven. We believe revival is now. We believe it's for Miami. We believe we're going to see the, uh, the glory of God in the land of the living now. So move in a mighty way with this seed, Lord. Expand it, multiply it, and bless the people who give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, guys, we are going to be in Genesis 19 today. So you can turn there. Um, it is the story of, of Lot and his wife and Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so I do want to leave a little bit of a disclaimer here. If you have young children, 
Um, it's up to you what you want to do. There is some adult subject matter. There's no way around that. Uh, the words are in the Bible. They're not my words. The themes, um, it's, it's Genesis 19 and 20. So you guys can decide if you want your kids to be here, uh, and we will get into it. So just to kind of bring us up to speed where we are, we're in Genesis, the first book in the Bible, creation. Lot is Abraham's nephew. So Lot and Abraham are co-laborers. They are uh, doing well together in livestock. They're successful. Um, they've earned money. They've, they've done well. Um, so much so that there's not enough room for the life, livestock. So Abraham and Lot's people start to kind of bicker and quarrel, uh, close quarters, that type of thing. So uh, Abraham suggests that they split up. Um, which they do, Abraham gives Lot the choice to, to pick a direction so he can either go uh, to Canaan or he can go in the other direction to Sodom. And Lot picks Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, two towns um, back in this time that were known for evil and wicked, sinful ways. So Lot ends up going to <clears throat> Sodom when we, when we read in Genesis 18, we read that the Lord goes to Abraham and essentially tells him that he's going to send some angels to see if Sodom is as bad as it really is. And if it is, he's going to destroy everything. So Abraham then goes to the Lord and prays on the behalf of the Sodomites, saying if there are 50 righteous people, and then it goes down to 40 and 30, Basically saying, if there's anyone righteous there, can you save Sodom? And the Lord says, I'll do it. And so that's kind of where we pick it up in, in verse 19, excuse me, in chapter 19. So we're going we're gonna to fly through some scripture. You guys got your Bibles ready? You guys ready? You awake? You ready to receive? Are you listening carefully? All right, let's go. Okay. So Genesis 19, verses 1 through 2, I'm reading out of the New International Version. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night, and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. Verses 3 and 4. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Verse 5. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. So what is happening here? What is happening here is, is we see that Lot is at the city gate. If you were at the city gate, you would have been somebody that's noteworthy, somebody who's knowledgeable, somebody who's of some significance. He's, he's a judge. So you'd really sit at the gate and you'd actually judge uh, the affairs and make decisions. So we know that Lot is somebody substantial. Angels have, have appeared as men, uh, probably good-looking men, that they're angels. Lot wants to protect the angels. And it's important to understand the concept, concept of this time. Hospitality was a very, very big deal. So for Lot to take in these men... It's unclear whether we, he know, we know if he knows they're angels. He does call them lords, but we don't really know. But he, he takes it upon himself as somebody who's a representative of Sodom at the gate to welcome them in. They want to stay in the square. He knows that the square is bad news. This is a wicked, awful, sinful city. So he says, come on in, get something to eat, take shelter in the night, and you can go wherever you need to go in the morning. And they agree. So these guys are all having a feast, and now you have to picture this. It's not a pretty sight. It says all of the men in the city, both young and old, so all the men 
are at the gate of the house and they're pounding on the house. They're banging on the doors, they're banging on the windows, and they're screaming at Lot to bring out the men that were with them. Why? So they can have homosexual rape relations with them. That's Sodom. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're dealing with. That's the type of wickedness. That's the type of evil. And so then we read in verses 6 and 7, Lot went outside to meet them, and he shut the door behind them, presumably to protect the men, the angels, and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. There are people who are banging down the door, demanding that the guests be brought out so that they can assault them. Lot comes out and he closes the door and he addresses those people as friends. There's other translations where he says brethren, brothers. Lot is a righteous man. We'll read about that in a second. Peter writes about it. So Lot is a righteous man, and he is amongst bad company. And I am persuaded to exhort you today that if you are to walk in the calling that God has for your life, one of the most important choices you can make is who you surround yourself with. It's paramount. It's vital. It's crucial. Who are you hanging out with? It's a big deal. We see that Lot is amongst really bad people. We struggle with this. We struggle with our company. Why do we do that? I think sometimes it's because of blood. Blood is thick. Sisters, brothers, fathers, mothers, cousins, uncles. It's complicated. In-laws. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue to run with Cousin Johnny, even though Cousin Johnny's a knucklehead. Blood. Soul ties. We don't really talk about soul ties enough. I might preach on soul ties. But it's a thing. I was... I was officiating a wedding in South Carolina last year, and I was kind of by myself, and I was getting a ride to the church, and it was kind of a lengthy ride, and my Uber driver was awesome. I was in the front seat. We were having a great conversation, showing him pictures of my kids. He was telling me about his life and everything. He was a man of God. It was, it was great. And we got to the point of his family, and he, he tells me the story. This is an older gentleman driving Uber. He tells me a story that he has four grown children, and one day his wife walks into the living room and says, I'm packing everything up and I'm leaving you. And she leaves him after 38 years for her high school sweetheart. And the reason she gave her husband was, I had to know what it would be like to be with him. Why? Because she has a soul tie that she hasn't renounced. Every day of that 38-year marriage, she was probably in some capacity thinking about that old high school sweetheart. It's a soul tie. Loyalty. The, the ride-or-die culture. Fear of man. Fear of, of really speaking up and guarding your, 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 yourself, putting up boundaries. I'm persuaded to think that some of the worst habits that we have as people are people. People become habits. And you say, because we hear this narrative all the time, well, Jesus, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus hung out with sinners. Jesus met with all people. Yes, and... Jesus was not down with the promiscuity of the woman at the well, right? 
Jesus wanted to show her who the Messiah was so that she could show all of Samaria who the Messiah was. Jesus wasn't hanging out with the adulterous woman that was about to get stoned while she was gallivanting with other men. Jesus wanted her to know that there's no condemnation in Jesus and that the message is sin no more. If Jesus had a reason to be talking to you, it's because he was teaching you. It's because he was loving you. It's because he was healing you. It's because he was saving you. It's not because he was joining the party. Don't twist it. Don't twist Jesus into your sin and justify it. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners. He cleansed them and made them righteous. So we, we see what's going on here. It's all in scripture, guys. It, Proverbs eleven twenty. the Lord detests those whose hearts are perverse. Galatians 6, we reap what we sow. Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad character corrupts good company. Let me remind some people in this room, you have a lifetime subscription with one or two people. You have a lifetime subscription with God, and you have a lifetime subscription with your spouse. Everyone else is subject to renewal. People should have to earn your company. They shouldn't have to earn your love because we love people, but they should have to earn entryway into your surroundings, into your spirit, into your home, into your free time, into your pastoring. Like we're called to pastor. But we have to make choices about who we let into those spaces. Your circle is important. Who you hang out with is important because a sinful circle will always lead you to compromise. When you get yourself around people who are not running towards Jesus and you are trying to run towards Jesus, that circle, it will compromise your walk. And I have lived this. I've lived it. And I know many of you have. And we've been doing a lot of testimony lately, and I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into this because well, I'm going to share it another time. I believe the Lord wants me to. But I ran and operated restaurants in Wynwood for a little over two years. Make no mistake about it, Wynwood is possessed. Wynwood is filled with principalities. I'm not kidding. There are unseen demons that's what's going on there. And they're sent from hell to vex and harass and kill and destroy and, 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 and confuse and irritate people. There are principalities in homes. There are principalities in cities, in neighborhoods. There are principalities in Facebook. There are principalities on TikTok. There are principalities everywhere. Like, they're, they're there. If you, if you could see with spiritual eyes, you'd be freaked out. They're demons. Winwood is dark. And I'm telling you, I, I sat down and I just made a list to this week. And it, it's not, the list is not done. I just started thinking about it. In my two years running a restaurant at Winwood, I, I witnessed the following in some capacity, whether it was every day or whether it was once, but I, I witnessed it and I saw it and I, it was there. You guys ready? Dishonor, dishonesty, atheism, Buddhism, Islam, deception, theft, gunshots, job abandonment, adultery, depression, apathy, verbal altercations, physical altercations, arrests, vomiting, public drunkenness, drug deals, drug use, panic attacks, foul language, objectification, noise pollution, medical emergencies, favoritism, sexual misconduct, both verbally and physically, littering, loitering, 
poverty, pornography, prostitution, promiscuity, public fornication, manipulation, betrayal, racism, crudeness, threats, lawsuits, domestic violence, sloth, greed, lust, vanity, homosexuality, homelessness, vandalism, witchcraft, divorce, envy, competition, slandering, mocking, rage, haughtiness, corruption, spirit of death, spirit of suicide. That's what I was in. And so Lot is a righteous man. And Lot is in Sodom. I was a righteous man, not self-righteous, not that I can do no wrong, but righteous. I know who I am. The blood paid for it. I'm a believer. I'm a Jesus follower. So I'm a righteous man in an unrighteous place. And I was known as the righteous man. I was the guy that actually looked the dishwasher in the eye. I was actually the one that would pray over people in a secular place. I was the one that would write scriptures on the toilet seat. I was the one that would lift people up, that I could actually see people, not just as waiters or bartenders, but human beings that are sons and daughters of people. I loved people. I, I was the one that got the, the messages from like, People, we would have meetings, and they're like, wow, this is different. I'm like, yeah, it's Jesus, right? Like, and then there were the ones that didn't get it, and they thought I was a, a bozo, like the Jesus guy, whatever, right? But I was there in my righteousness, shining light and doing what I could. But come on, man. All that stuff, compromise, compromise, compromise. A little, a little, a little, like your actions, your, your moods, how you show up, and, and ultimately my behavior. It, it was all affected. So much so that I didn't even really like who I was. I didn't like who I was becoming. I didn't, I, it wasn't enough just to go to church on Sunday and then go back into that hellhole for six days. It grieved me. And it started making me do things I didn't want to do. And I was missing my family. And I was overworked. And I was tired. And I was drinking too much. And I was just, you know, not good. It's like a Picasso in your house. If you had a Picasso in your house, it's a beautiful, awesome painting. But if your two-year-old comes and finger paints all over it, and then the dog goes over and lifts its leg over it, it's not really, it's a Picasso, but it's compromised. It's like, uh, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is when a righteous person is outnumbered on the daily by just sin and wickedness. And I'm not talking about somebody that's difficult in your cubicle. We're always going to have to deal with some difficult people in some difficult situations. I'm talking about principalities. I'm talking about like places where the Lord is disgusted. It's compromise. We are called to fit in. Excuse me. We are not called to fit in. We are called to be set apart. So think about your circle. Think about your people. As you are trying to walk, presumably everyone in here is trying to walk with Jesus. Or at the least is, is curious to do so. Manipulation in your circle not Jesus. Control is not Jesus. Passive aggressiveness is not Jesus. Pride is not Jesus. Bullying is not Jesus. Sarcasm and immaturity is not Jesus. Bitterness, envy, competition is not Jesus. Lewdness, sexual immorality, it's not Jesus. If that's in your circle, it's affecting you. Again, Jesus, who did he hang out with? Jesus hung out with disciples who wanted to be like Jesus. That's who he hung out with. If you look at the Greek of follow, it literally means step into your footsteps. The, the idea of following Jesus is wherever he goes, just put your foot and just keep doing that. Je Jesus' disciples, they didn't want to be, Paul didn't, uh, John didn't want to be like John. Luke didn't want to be like Luke. They all wanted to be like Jesus. 
what does your circle look like? Does it look like people that want to be like Jesus? Mature hangs out with mature. Holy hangs out with holy. Sober hangs out with sober. Pure hangs out with pure. Hopeful hangs out with hopeful. Jesus people hang out with Jesus people. And so there are decisions to make. And there is compromise that takes place when we are trying to walk in ascending holiness amongst people that are not. And here's that scripture about Lot and his righteousness. This is Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. In 2 Peter 2, 6 through 8, he says, If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is talking about the Lord, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. So are you tracking this? You following? So he's, he's not liking what he's seeing. Lot, it hurts his heart. It hurts his soul. He doesn't like to see the debauchery. He doesn't like to see the unholiness. And so it hurts his heart. Why? Because it's, he's righteous. When you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, that deposit that we talked about, you're going to start to become unnumb to things you were numb about. Things that used to just be okay will grieve you. And that, that will never end. Michelle and I, to this day, stuff pops up and we're like, how were we watching this six months ago? And it's not even that bad, so to speak. It's just like, I, that's just not Jesus. It's just not Jesus. Give me Jesus. We're singing about it. I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. We're meant to be set apart. So we've got Lot in his compromise, and we pick it back up in the scriptures. Chapter 19, verse 8. And this is, again, Lot, right? Remember? These guys are all banging down his door. They're furious. They want, they want the men. He says, look. I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. So you can talk about the hospitality and how much importance they put on that, but as a, as a father of two daughters, this is disgusting. Like, this is tough scripture, guys. I know it's heavy, but this is the Bible. And there's stories here that we need to learn from. So Lot is now saying, leave these guys alone. Don't rape them. Do what you will to my daughters who have not been with a man. And he's a righteous man. So at this point, the angels have seen enough, right? Remember, they came down. They were, the Lord sent them to say, Go check it out. If it's as bad as if, if it's as bad as the cries have, have come to us, we're gonna blow it up. He's like, blow it up. The angels are like, we're done. <laughs> we're done. We've seen enough. <laughs> oh, the Bible is amazing. <laughs> Chapter 19, verse 12 to 14. The two men said to Lot, they've already told him that they're gonna destroy everything. And they're going to save Lot. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? Sons-in-laws, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out of here. Because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. The daughters that he was going to allow to be raped were ready to be married. It's crazy. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. 
how many times do we preach Jesus and people think we're joking? How many times are people tied up in casual Christianity where they're just flippant about the scriptures, flippant about what it means to, 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 to truly walk in truth and grace and not abuse and twist grace or not twist the gospels into your lifestyle? On Friday, I was preparing for the sermon a little bit and studying down by the water. I was having a beautiful time. And my phone rang, and it was a number I didn't know. And somebody said, hi, Mr. Grocer. This is Camille with some, some realtor group. I said, hi, Camille. She says, well, you've got an attractive home, and the market is hot right now, so I was wondering if you'd be willing to sell your home. And I said, I don't think so right now, Camille. And she says, okay, well, would you, be con would you consider selling it in the next 12 months? And I, I said, Camille, listen. I am a follower of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If he wants me to sell my house, it's going to be sold. If he doesn't want me to sell my house, we're not going anywhere. I haven't heard anything one way or another, but if I do, I guess the chips will fall where they may. And there's just silence. <laughs> I say, Camille, let me ask you something. Are you a Jesus follower? And she hangs up. So let me get this straight. You, you found my phone number, you know my name, and you're, you're, you're calling me without an appointment. We can, so we, we have to talk about my house that's not for sale, but we can't talk about Jesus. It's okay. But it, it's a picture, guys, of, of listen, as all of us, those of us who evangelize, it's common, right? I mean, because two hours later, I went to Milam's and bought some chicken, and this guy's like, who are you, man? I wish everyone was as kind as you. I'm like, it's Jesus. So he received it. You're not trying to bat a thousand in the evangelism world. It's not our job. Jesus does the work. We plant the seeds. But it is interesting because I wasn't kidding. Like, it's funny, but I really wasn't kidding. I really did earnestly, sincerely ask Camille, like, do you, are you a follower of Jesus? Because if she would have been open to have a conversation, I would have preached the good news to her. I would have explained what freedom in Christ truly means. This poor woman, and I'm not shaming her or guilting her, but she actually thinks selling homes is important. I think her salvation is important. I didn't hang up on her. She hung up on me. She thought it was a joke. Lot is telling the, the sons-in-laws, the future sons-in-laws, this place is going to burn. Get out. And they're like, oh, funny. And it happens today. And you, you read verse 15. It says, with the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry. There's urgency here. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. The scripture says that Lot hesitated. These guys are panicked. The angels are using exclamation marks. They're saying, hurry. He, he hesitates to the point where the angels physically grab them by the hands and pull them out. Like God is saving them. Why does he hesitate? Because Sodom has become attractive to him. He's not even so sure he wants to go. And the same can be said for Lot's wife. 
she looked back. Not only did Lot hesitate, but a few verses later, he actually has an opinion with the angels. I don't want to go to the mountains. He says, flee to the mountains. I don't want to go. How about if I go to Zoar? And they're like, oh, okay, we can comply with that. Go to Zoar. Zoar means insignificant. It means little insignificant town. So you have a lot who doesn't necessarily know if he wants to leave the sinful setting that he's living in to the point where the angels are saving him. God is saving him. And then where God wants him to go, he's like, I'd rather go somewhere insignificant. We are not called to live insignificant lives in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. If you are being told to go to insignificant, you are being told a lie. The Lord has significant places for you. And so he goes to Zoar, but not with his wife because Lot's wife looked back. And I forgot to even say the scripture in the beginning. I was going to, but we'll still get to it. But it's in Luke. Jesus is preaching about the end times in Luke. And he says the second shortest scripture in the Bible. The first one is in, I think it's in John 11, Jesus wept. This one's the second shortest. It says, remember Lot's wife, exclamation mark. Meaning like Jesus is emphatically reminding these people to remember Lot's wife from thousands of years ago that doesn't even have a name. Why? Because they told her not to look back when they were saving her and she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. She was being saved and she was destroyed. When you read the scriptures and you study this, it's not that she just looked back. It, said that, it says that she looked back longingly. And that, my friends, is what being in sin and being around sin will do. It will make a righteous person start to have appetites that a righteous person should not have. It will make you start to have desires that used to be undesirable. And that's what happened to Lot. She, that her wife, she's like, I don't really know if I want to go. The place is burning. Like we read these scriptures and we don't realize like it, they're for today. They're for this. Guys, Miami's going to burn someday. Just read Revelation. It's too heavy. <laughs> she looked back longingly. <laughs> we we've got, we've got to we've got to hang on loosely, guys. In, in this kingdom, it, it's again, ha ha. You really don't get to decide if you're going to sell your house or not if you're surrendered. Stop hanging on so tight. They're not your things. They're God God's things. We preach it around here. We're not circumstantial. It's not, okay, my business is thriving, I'll be generous. It's no, I'll just be generous. It's not, well, my marriage is going well and my kids are healthy, praise God. Or it's not, my, this person's in the hospital, they didn't get healed, now I'm not going to go to church for three months because God didn't heal them, and now I don't know who God is. All that stuff we preach, right? Like it's not circumstantial. He's good. My dog is in the hospital. They're doing the blood test. I believe that his liver is being healed right now in the name of Jesus. I do. And a little 10-month-old 10 10 puppy, he's awesome, and I love him, and I'm praying for him, and I'm cheering for him. And we're supposed to get a call tonight. Whatever happens with this dog, if he comes home healed and whole and lives 15 years with us, which I do believe he's going to do in Jesus' name, we celebrate and we honor God. We worship him. If the Lord takes him home, I don't understand why, but I'm going to worship him anyway. Why? Because my worship is not circumstantial, and God does not owe me any explanations. 
God does not owe you any reasons why he does the things he does. He just doesn't. He's the Lord. He's sovereign. He's God. We are dust. He loves us. We're made in his image. We're going to live in his kingdom. He's got, a, he's got a table ready for us. But we also, if we surrender, we don't get to choose. We don't get to just do what we want. And the, 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 the thing about this whole, like the sinful thing and, and longing for the past and looking back, like there's a big, big difference between not doing something that you kind of want to do and just being totally delivered. Like, I'm not going to drink alcohol because it doesn't line up with who I want to be. But I kind of, I see the guys at the bar. I see the beer commercial at the Super Bowl, and it, it looks fun, and I kind of miss it. That's terrible. That's not freedom. Freedom is just being delivered. I don't like the smell. I don't like the taste. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. So it's, again, it's not us in us. It's Christ in us that is going to take away those sinful appetites. So if you truly do want to move on from some of these things that hinder you, some of these people that hinder you, it's, it's, it's a right move to ask the Lord to take it away, to ask the Lord to change your heart, to ask the Lord to move on behalf of you. Because it's the power of the blood that provides the change that gets you into him and gets him into you and lets you walk like a true disciple. But when you're in that sanctification process and he's doing a good work in you, you can't be hanging out with hooligans. <sighs> it, it, we, we remember and we don't look back. Our God does not live in the past. He is not sentimental. He does not long for the good old days. He is into new things. He's the God of all things new. Isaiah 43, forget the former things. I am doing a new thing. I don't care if you're 15 or 85 in this room. He wants to do a new thing in you. That's who he is. He just doesn't care about last week. He knows it was there. He knows what happened. He's moving. It's all fluid. You, you give yourself such a disservice when you look back, when you, when you can't let go, when you look in the past. That's what this paid for. He went on the tree so that you could just wake up with new mercy every single day. You've been forgiven. You've been cleansed. Walk in that. Remember. Remember what he did for you. Remember the... But don't look back. Look forward with excitement. Zeal for the house. I mean, who's excited about what the Lord is doing at one name? Things are growing. Things are changing. It's the little things, guys. Pastor Jesus calls me up on Friday. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. What are you doing? <laughs> he, says, he says, well, I'm at church because the windows are dirty. I hired somebody to clean them. And he didn't put it on the church dime. The, the guy's pretty busy. He actually drove over here on Friday because while all of us probably noticed the windows were dirty, we didn't do anything about it, myself included. He's like, I, I'm going to call a guy, and when we walk in on Sunday, the windows are going to be perfect. And, and, and the, Lord, the Lord just, that, that moves his heart. My friend Erica, I don't know if you've used the men's room today, but it seems like it's the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's, there's body balms and sprays and I think Anthony smells like teak wood. <laughs> if she did it out of her own goodwill. No one told her to do it. No one paid for it. She did. It, it, it's family, guys. It's family. Check your email this week. We're going to have a meeting on Saturday. It's going to be good. It's for the family. Um, but guys, my, my, my exhortation, and we'll wind this down, 
as your, as your pastor, as somebody who prays for you, as somebody who loves you, as somebody who just really is falling in love with, with just this, and, and this, this, Anthony says it all the time, like, this is our life. Can you believe it? I cannot believe it. I don't understand. Even, even the bad stuff, guys, even the tough stuff, we're doing it together. Like, it's just not so bad when you got Jesus lovers around you and you got Jesus in your, in your prayer closet and the Holy Spirit in your heart. It's refreshing. But my exhortation to you is to, to do some inventory today and in the days to come. And when we worship at the end, I invite you to, to, to drop it at the altar. Renounce it. Think about the people, the places, the habits, the thoughts, and all the things in your life currently, not 10 years ago, currently, that do not assist you in becoming who you're called to be in Christ. Those things, they don't belong. You can leave lighter today. It's not for me to tell you what those things are. That's a personal, honest conversation with you and your creator. And it's a repentance. It's a, a, an earnest willingness to say, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to go there anymore. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to keep thinking this. And so now I'm going to say, I repent and I give it to the foot of the cross. Put it into the pits of hell, Jesus, and now fill me up. Fill me up with what's next. Fill me up with what's new. Let me march forward like the kingdom warrior that I am. I brought it in. I didn't take it out. That's why we came. We came to worship. We came to meet. We came to edify. We came to preach. We came to, to be around each other, have apostolito. We also came to be delivered from things that don't serve us. Like the miracles are for today. They're for right now. We're singing about the miracles. If you need a miracle in your life, open up your mouth. I would encourage you when we worship, sing. It doesn't matter if, if you're good. He thinks you're good. He gave you your voice. Use it. Sing to him. It stirs him up. That's why we put the lyrics up. He wants to hear your voice because he thinks it's angelic. He thinks it's beautiful. He loves to hear his children praise his holy name. Amen. So compromise is where Lot is. And we're going to finish his story. You guys got 10 good minutes left? All right. His wife looks back and is destroyed. He goes to a town called Insignificant when they told him to flee to the mountains. He goes to the mountains and he's afraid. So, excuse me, he goes to the Insignificant town and he's afraid. How many times do we go somewhere God tells us not to go and then we get there and it freaks us out? It's disobedience. It's disobedience. So now he doesn't want to be in the town of insignificance. So what does he do? He takes his two daughters and takes them to a cave. And in that cave, his two daughters realize they're alone. And they realize that their husbands-to-be got blown up in a fiery furnace of sulfur sent from heaven. Because they thought it was a joke. So... Now, the, you want to, presumably they all lived in Sodom, right? His daughters live with him. So how, how did Sodom affect his daughters? This is what their idea is. We don't have any men. We want children. We want to have the right to be a mother. Why don't we get dad drunk and just lay with him? And it's common when women are together that they sort of, sort of share the same cycles. So the first woman gets her dad blackout drunk and sleeps with him. This is, again, a righteous man. A righteous man gets blackout drunk, impregnates his daughter. The second night, the, se the second daughter, the same thing. And now, these two have children. One is Ben-Ami. The other is Moab. Who are these guys? They're the people that would start the Ammonites and the Moabs. Who are the Ammonites and the Moabs? They're groups of people who would oppose Israel. There's consequences for your actions. We talk about generational curses. 
remember Lot's wife. Look at this, guys. This is, this is, this is real. We're in the book of Luke. Jesus is preaching. Jesus has been preaching to people. Jesus, he, the message about saving people is a big deal. We get a bad rap. Like, oh, brimstone and fire. Yeah, I, I know that there's some aggressive approaches out there, but it's real. Matthew gets real in 18. In Matthew 18, verse 6, Jesus gets very, very real. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, meaning people who love me and follow me, if anyone causes them to stumble, it would be better if they had a large millstone put around their neck, dropped into the sea, and drowned. Getting in the way of somebody's walk is no good in Jesus' sight. And now he's preaching in Luke, and he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, the great and dreadful days of Noah, right? Dreadful for everybody, great for Noah and his family. So also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That's the end times. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and be given to marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed all of them. Noah let the scoffers scoff. Everybody said, there's no rain. What are you talking about? He must have heard the most insulting insults. And Noah built that ark because he was a righteous man walking in obedience. Then we read Jesus saying, it was the same in the days of Lot. Again, Jesus is going all the way back to this story. It's important. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Sounds like the world today. People were doing life. But the day Lot left Sodom, the day I saved Lot, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. He's reminding everybody, remember to not look back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. It's backwards in the kingdom. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. And then they ask him, well, what about the dead? And he's like, well, the vultures eat the dead. Like, like this is the gospel, man. Jesus doesn't play. There is a kingdom that we talked about and we prayed about. And we have the opportunity to go there and take as many people as we can get to go there. And look what happens. You have two righteous men. Noah is righteous. Noah is obedient. And humanity gets a rewind. That's powerful. He actually does what God says, creates the boat, and all of the wickedness is taken out, and we have a new humanity. Lot is a righteous man. Except that he's not in obedience. He's in partial obedience, which is total disobedience. So Lot is totally disobedient. So whereas Noah, everybody got a rewind, with Lot, we got another Sodom and Gomorrah. He passed it down. And that is what all of us will do if we don't check our sin. Your unresolved sin will be passed down to the next generation. It's just what it is. Your children are going to know exactly who you are. They're going to know who you are. They're going to know the real you. They're going to know the real things you did, the real things you said. All darkness must come to the light. So what happened is, in Zephaniah, we read about this. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, Surely Moab will become like Sodom, the Ammonites like Gomorrah, 
a place of weeds and salt pits, a waste land forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. So essentially what Lot did in his disobedience is God saved him from Sodom. And he created a whole nother Sodom and Gomorrah, a whole nother generation of wickedness, a whole nother generation of people pounding on doors demanding to rape angels. It's important to repent. It's important to let things go. It's important to remember. Deuteronomy 32, 7, remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations. Remember, learn from the past generations. Ephesians 2, 12 to 13, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Remember the darkness of your life without Jesus. Hebrews 10.32, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured conflict of sufferings. After we got enlightened, we're, we're, we're made to suffer. It's not, it's not popular preaching, but it's a thing, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it together, and we're going to give God the glory. We're going to suffer for a little while, and we're going to go live in heavenly realms. It's okay. It's worth suffering for. He's worth suffering for. He suffered. Revelation 2, 5, remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. That's his mercy. Do you know how much time he gave Sodom before he burned it? Do you know how much time he's giving on this earth to have other kingdoms rule? The, the, the kingdom of God is not the only kingdom ruling, if you haven't noticed. The kingdoms of darkness are everywhere. He's allowing it. Why is he allowing it? Because that gives time for us to get the lost and bring them to the feet of Jesus. Second Peter, he says, always remind you of such things. I always remind you of such things. What does he remind us of? He reminds us that his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. He reminds us that we may participate in the divine nature. He reminds us that he has given us great and precious moments. He, re he reminds us that we've escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. We do not have to take part. He reminds us that as we add to our faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. He reminds us that we are becoming love. And so as we close today, we're going to worship. I invite you up. I invite you to spend some time with the Lord. We can pray for you if you want any sort of ministering, praying. We can do that. If you're, if you're sick, we want to put hands on you and heal you. Um, but it's also your time to repent. And I want to remind you today. I, rem I want to remind you that you're, you're a son and you're a daughter. And I want to encourage you and I want to remind you not to live below the privileges of the kingdom. You have privileges. You do not have to put up with the filth of this world. You do not have to see it. You don't have to know it. You don't have to experience it. Don't live below the privileges of the kingdom. And I want to remind somebody today that that cross... That cross is about sacrifice, but it's not just about sacrifice. It's about a birthright. A birthright adopted into sonship and daughtership. 
that is a sacrifice. It's also a coronation. Like, let this run through your brain for a week. A coronation. No blood, no kingdom. Blood and faith. You've been coronated into the kingdom. A crown has been put on your head. A, a member of a kingdom knows who he is and knows who she is. Nobody in a holy kingdom would live in Sodom. Nobody in a holy kingdom would allow the world to compromise who they are in Christ. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. This is a journey. None of us are finished products. We all have stuff. I get that. I have my own. I ask the Lord to sanctify me. But I'm aware of my steps in a way that I've never been before. Be aware of your steps. Might I remind you, be careful. Be careful. Be careful who you let pray for you. Be careful who you let speak life into you. Be careful who you're spending your time with. Be careful what phone calls you're answering. Be careful what Instagrams you're going on. Be careful who you're who you're dealing with. Be careful. Be careful about what time of day you're out. Children live in the light because there's darkness out there and just like Jesus is quoted in Luke, there will be the fires and the floods. Like, that's where everyone thinks it's a joke. It, it might not happen while you're living on this earth, but it is going to happen. And some are going to get saved and some aren't. But the person you tell Jesus about today might be the person that tells someone great, great, great grandfather about Jesus down the line. Like we, we talk about the generational curses. Yeah, if we don't check ourselves, if we don't get into obedience and right standing, we could create another Sodom and Gomorrah. But if we evangelize and we walk in the calling of who we are, if we allow him to sanctify ourselves, if we allow Jesus to get inside of us and we start moving through this space, this space called Miami, if we start revival, if we get serious about our walk and we let him to do his work and his will amongst us, now we're moving forward in power and strength. And the people that we tell Jesus about, it's generational effects. I can't tell Jesus. I can't tell my kids about Jesus if I don't know Jesus. Now you've told someone's kid, someone's dad about Jesus. And now they can tell their kids. It's a whole trickle down effect. So even if the end times don't come while you're here, they're still coming and it's still generational. Think about the deeper things of God, guys. Think about the deeper things. Understand. Understand. Get revelation. Because everybody's out there marrying and mingling, drinking and dancing, and weddings and working. And I get it, and it's life, and we all have to do it to some degree. But there's a real thing going on in the spirit, and there's a real day coming in the Revelation days. He wants us ready. He wants us ready. He wants us ready. And so today, as we worship, we have one more opportunity to walk away from what is not like him and to walk into our calling in his life. We have one more day to become more like the bride that he deserves at the altar. Amen.
all names. God, we thank you for your availability. Now we just call on your name and you are there. Jesus, the only reason any of us showed up today, Jesus, we don't want any part of any of this if you're not in it, Lord. We thank you for the message today, God, so much truth spoken in love. I thank you, Lord, for every single person in this room, God. I pray blessings over every single one of them as they go about their way this week, Father. God, through this process where you're continuing to sanctify us, Holy Spirit, I just pray that we return next Sunday and all of us look a little bit more like you. Let us follow as Pastor Jeff was saying, we follow in your footsteps. You go here, I'm gonna follow you. My footstep right in yours. Jesus, we thank you for the leader that you are. We thank you that though every single one of us in this room is a leader, we are always first a follower. And we just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We don't want anything else. We don't need anything else. We worship and praise your mighty name, the name of Jesus. Wish you all the best week. Thank you for joining us here today. We love you so much. Thank you for being a part. Thank you for leaning in. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for praying over each other.